Amen. Okay, we are in Psalm 122 today. I'm real excited about this psalm uh, uh, because it has a lot of application for our day and time today. They all do. They all have application. But this one is going to tell us several things about God's kingdom, God's house, maybe is a better one since that's the way it says in the text, about the house of God. And I've got four points, four major points that I'm wanting to make from this uh, from this study. And... Uh, um, we're going to, we're going to note them as we go along. I think yesterday I gave you all, I think yesterday I gave you all four of my points at once and, uh, and, uh, I gave it, I gave it all away and then I taught it. Well, this time you're going to get it as you, as it comes. So let's see how that works. Okay. Let's read the, let's read the Psalm and then we'll get started. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Now, good morning, Don. Morning, Edie. Um, I want us to make, make perfectly clear the context of the writer saying this. We don't. We're not told at the beginning of 122 that this is David. I, I, I've always, I've always felt it probably was David. But again, please understand something. It doesn't really matter who the author of any book or any part of a book of the Bible is. We understand from First uh, Peter. I'm sorry, Second Peter, chapter one, at the very end of chapter one, that it all comes from God. It's not a matter of the writer's personal interpretation. But, but what is written in God's word comes from God. And so that we, we like to point out David said this or Paul said this merely so we can get an understanding of the man and what the man taught and, and, and things of that nature. But quite frankly, it, it's, it's almost a waste of time because God's word, God is the author of his word. OK, it may it may it may help us to categorize stuff in our head. But quite frankly, it really doesn't matter who the writer is. But we do know one thing about the writer. This writer wrote hundreds of years before Jesus Christ was born on the earth. And when he speaks of Jerusalem here, he is talking about Jerusalem. Okay, you're going to see why I'm saying it that way. You might be sitting there going, well, duh, Albert, of course he is. You know, what? what why would I think otherwise? You'll see in a few moments ago why, why I'm saying that. Um, but the things that he says, remember what we see in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Um, the, the things that we see in the Old Testament are written for our learning. We, are, we can learn something from it. We can learn something about God's, God's attitude, in this case, God's attitude about Jerusalem, about his house, the house of God, God's attitude about what should be happening among his people in Jerusalem. And therefore, learning about that attitude when we come to the New Testament, which the Old Covenant, as we're seeing in our study in Hebrews, is a shadow of what is going to be or is, since we're in the New Covenant, for them is going to be, what is under the New Covenant. And so what we can learn about God's attitude towards Jerusalem and his house is going to have application to us today. All right? So let's look at it verse by verse. First off, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Look at the, look at the, first off, the pride. And I don't mean that word in a bad way. The pride, the, the joy. Let me say it that way so you don't get the right, wrong idea with my word pride. The joy of being among God's people. And yes, the realization, I am part of her. And in, in this regard, I am in God's city. Because Jerusalem is the city of God. 
All right. Um, it, it was a city of God under the old covenant uh, because the Israelites were God's chosen people. And he's the one who put them in Jerusalem, had them there, had his house, his temple. But right now his tabernacle, well, depending on who wrote this, I'm sorry, mine does say this is a psalm, this is a psalm of David. I just noticed that. I was looking at the wrong place. It, this is a psalm of David. So yes, the tabernacle is is up right now. Solomon is the one who built the, uh, the, the temple, and that was David's son. So he's talking about the tabernacle is there. Well, it was. It was there at that time. Morning, Stephen. Morning, Wayne. So he's saying, I was glad when they said, let's go up there. Now, let, let me cut to the chase. Go with me, if you will. Hold your hand right here. <clears throat> Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. When, when, when David is saying, I am glad when they said, let's go up to the house of God, to the tabernacle. When we are in the new covenant, we come to find out what is the house of God today. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17 says this. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Now he's speaking to the church in Corinth. And this idea of them being the, the house of God the, the temple, yeah, the temple of God is not limited just to the church in Corinth. It is God's church is his temple today. Why? Because his spirit resides there. The Holy Spirit resides within each individual Christian. And therefore, the, the individual Christians together make up God's house, God's sure. temple. Okay, we, we you will see, by the way, when you go to First Corinthians chapter six, each individual Christian is the temple of God. But again, going back to verse 16 and 17 of First Corinthians three, he's talking to the church as a whole. And the reason he's mentioning it to the church as a whole is because they are dividing one another. They are fighting with one another in Corinth. Go all the way back to chapter one and you'll see that. And so so. Paul, God through Paul is saying, don't you understand if you destroy the temple of God, if you're, if you're fighting amongst yourself and causing difficulties within the temple of God, God will destroy you. God is against that idea. This is where his Holy Spirit resides. So recognizing that the church is the New Testament house of God. Remember what I said? The Old Testament was a shadow of what was going to be today. Under the Old Testament, it was a building, or in this case, a tent, a, you know, a structure to be inside. That was where God resided, where his, his Ark of the Covenant was, and it had the mercy seat, and God resided right there. Well, that was a physical thing today, and that was what was holy, all right? Holy ground, set apart, needed to do something special there, needed to be something special there that was set apart to God. You didn't do sinful things within God's temple. Most certainly not. That was sacrilege. Well, now the church is God's temple, not the building. Again, a lot of people call the building the church. I like to say church building. It's the building where the church enters to worship, okay? Because the church is the people. It is not the building. I, you know, if there's anything, if there's one thing that I'm appreciating with this this virus situation and the lockdown that we had, which those of you who know me, I'm not very appreciative of that. But if there's anything that I appreciate about it is a meme that I've been seeing going around the the the, the internet, around Facebook that I'm on, that is is says it's saying you can't lock down the church. The church is God's people. All right? And the church, the church is the people. And I'm sitting there going, yes, amen. Finally, people are getting it. They get it because of a because of a situation that we're having right now. <laughs> they understand that we are God's church, and so okay. Let me get off my soapbox for a moment. Go go and see what again what he's saying in verse one. Then I was glad when they said me said to me, "Let's go to the house of God. Let's go be God's church. Let's be together as His church." Okay. First off, 
individually, when one becomes a Christian, they should be glad to be entering God's church, God's people, God's household, all right? But then, and I've seen this among the congregation here, um, I, I love this one, uh, I mean, I, I've heard several comments, but one particular comment that, is, that has just struck me by someone who was so excited about the fact that we were going to start having assembly again, so excited, could not wait to be together again when we haven't been able to be so for two months. And, uh, and, and that just that was that is what David is saying here. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We ought to be glad. You know, it always gets me when someone says, do I have to be there Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night? Uh, and I think you all have heard me say this before. When someone says those words, there's already a problem. Why are you asking if you have to be there? Why, why is it something that you feel you have to go? All right. If you feel you have to go, stay home. <laughs> you know, if that's your attitude that you have to be there, I mean, I guess in one regard, coming, maybe you'll learn to have a better attitude. That I guess that's one way of looking at it. But you're already defeated if you feel you have to be there. This is a this is the attitude that we're seeing here of David for God's physical building is the attitude that we ought to have for God's spiritual building, his church. Okay. Um, our, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. One thing, too, that yeah. might, we might observe is that our, our being glad or the joy of being together mm -hmm. is not only at Sunday morning worship, Sunday evening yeah. and Wednesday evening, Amen. but it's other times. It doesn't have to do yeah. with worship, but yeah. for Christians together as a group. Amen. It's, it should be something that's joyful. Yes. It, joyful as, and, and sadly, a lot of people have family that they're not joyful to be around. But the, the, the norm of families is to be joyful when you come together because you're connected by physical blood and you miss seeing that family member. Well, that kind of joyfulness within God's spiritual family is the way it ought to be. That's an excellent point, Bob. That is. Um, uh, so, uh, our feet, listen to the pride. That's why I said the word pride earlier. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. How exciting to be in the city of God. Now, once again, and we're going to see more about this when we get down to verses five through nine, but I want to, I want to make a point of it before we get there, since he mentions Jerusalem here. Go with me again to Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 13. And I, this is, by the way, in our Hebrews class. Or it's chapter 12. I'm sorry, I said 13. In our Hebrews class, we're getting closer and closer to here. This is my favorite part of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12, uh, the latter part of it, when he says what he does here. All right. Um, a lot of people like to look at Hebrews 11, and I think it's very good. I like it too. A lot of people like to see various parts of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter chapter 10, verse 25 is the one that a lot of people will oftentimes use to talk about how we're supposed to come together as a people. Well, that's kind of nice. I understand that. But listen to this. Uh, in our Hebrews class, we've been talking about how the Hebrew writer is trying to get his readers, the ones he's writing to specifically, to recognize how much better God's new covenant and everything involved in it, we call it the New Testament, but God's New Testament is over the old, all right? He's, he's been trying to show him all the way through, and now he's making a major boom with his sledgehammer. He's driving that, that nail home. Let me read, start with verse 20. He's going to make a distinction between the physical that Moses was on Mount, Mount, uh, the Mount Sinai. I always want to put Moses on Mount Ararat. I almost said it again. He's on Mount Sinai. All right, the physical of him being on Mount Sinai and the spiritual of the new covenant equivalent, okay? Verse 20, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. He's talking about what the Israelites were told, standing, uh, standing at the foot of Mount Sinai while Moses went up to receive the law, okay? 
They couldn't even stand to be there. They, their, their total awe and fear of God was there. Well, now listen to what he says, verse 21. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear, but you, now this is what it was like for Moses and the Israelites at the, mount, at the foot of Mount Sinai. But you, speaking of, of people under the new covenant today, but you have come to Mount Zion. Oh, wait a minute, I'm not at the foot of a mountain. Well, keep reading. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Sound like what David says in Psalm 1? And to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festival, in festival gathering, and to the assembly, or church, many of your translations will have. That's that word for church. And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spiritual and I'm sorry, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to be sprink and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, each one of those things he mentions earlier in the book of Hebrews. Most every one of those he mentions early in the book of Hebrews. Well, he's wrapping it up. And he's saying, Moses came to a physical mountain, and yes, they were in all of God. God physically being there. But you are so much better coming to a spiritual mountain, Mount Zion. And by the way, that word Zion is another word for Jerusalem that, that the Israelites used for Jerusalem. So that Jerusalem is what I'm wanting to look at. Okay, And then he goes on to say the heavenly Jerusalem. So he, does, he doesn't leave any doubt about it whatsoever to innumerable angels and festival gatherings, to the church of the firstborn. All of these are talking about the same thing, God's church. So again, go back to Psalm 122. So again, in verse 2, when he says, Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Well, just like the Israelites standing at the foot of Mount, Zion, of, of Mount Sinai, we are on... We are not just at the foot of the Mount Sinai. We Christians are in, on Mount Zion, the holy city of Jerusalem, the spiritual Jerusalem, the church of the firstborn. So, so yes, this is David's attitude towards the city of Jerusalem, the tabernacle that was standing, but it should be our attitude towards God and what God would have us to be. All right, what, God, what, what, we, what we should feel about God's kingdom. Look at verse 3. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. It was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the, in the, to the name of the Lord. So David's all excited. Jerusalem is the focal point. All of the tribes of the Lord. Now he's talking about all of God's people. Remember the 12 tribes they were broken up into, but they all came together. The men of those tribes came together three times a year to Jerusalem in order to, in order to do their festivals that they're required to do. And the temple was where they would come whenever they wanted to come and worship God. The, or the, at this time, the tabernacle is where they came when they wanted to worship God, when they wanted to offer sacrifice. This is where they came. So he's saying, we're bound together firmly because of Jerusalem. Well, that's how God's people should be today. Not just, in, not just in the old covenant times, but today we are bound together as God's church. We are, we are to feel that, that strength, that unity. The unity, by the way, that Jesus prayed about in John chapter 17, praying to God at the very end of John 17, that we would be one as he and the Father are one, well, for David's day, Jerusalem was what bound them together. For our day, God's church, God's people are bound together by as his church. Okay. Albert? Yes, sir. Reminded me of some of the words that Paul wrote to the Ephesians mm -hmm. in, in chapter 2 at the end of the verse. And ye are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, 
here it is, in whom all the building fitly framed together goes yeah. unto the holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also have built it together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Which verse? Oh, what's the reference for that, please? That's that's chapter two of First Peter, verses twenty through twenty-two. Of of what? First Peter or no? Uh, no Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians. Sorry, I was thinking First Peter because I'm one because uh, there's something similar in First Peter. I uh, want us to look at as well. Yeah, that's exactly. We are we are built together as a, and I love that idea of being built together as a house. Well, as long as we're looking at that idea and as long as we're there, turn now to First Peter. Same idea of what uh, of what uh, Bob was just saying. First Peter two nine and ten. In fact, let's start a little bit earlier than nine. First Peter two nine and ten. Let's start, let's start in verse four. As you come to him, speaking of Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. That's just like what we saw in Ephesians that Bob just mentioned. Being built up a spiritual house. Um, da, 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 got off my, started talking. There we go. To be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices. I mean, look at that idea, like a temple, a tabernacle where sacrifices are given, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, for, for it stands in scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion. There's that idea of Zion, the church, a stone, a cornerstone and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So, so the honor is for you who believe, look at that, the honor is for you. Look at the honor that David felt standing at the gates of Jerusalem. The honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Now, here's what I was wanting to get up to, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Look at that unity that drawing together, standing as one, okay? That, that is the honor that he's talking about up there. The idea that because of the sins that I've committed, even with the sins I've committed in the past, God is able to use me, to use me within his kingdom. As long as I come back to him, I always want to make that point. I think everyone recognizes that. You don't stay in that sin. You leave it. You come to God. Now go back again to, to Psalm 122. Okay. Now, yes. one, one thing, too, about those sure. verses in, in 1 Peter, uh -huh. and in verse, uh, verse uh, where is it? In verse 6, I like the idea the King James uses not just a cornerstone, he's the chief, the chief cornerstone. cornerstone. That's right. That's right. Yeah, he's the one, he's the one you build off of. He, the, right. They would take a stone that was going to, that was necessary to make the building like they wanted it to be, and they would build off of it. It would be the guide for the rest of the building. Hey, Jake, Hi. good to have you with us. Um, and Archie, good to see you too. And Stephen, wow, good to, good to have you here. Um, now, turn with me, go with me back to Psalm 122. And my next point is just one verse, verse five. Look at verse five there. Your throne for judgment was were set. I'm sorry, thrones. There, not your there thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David, T-H-E-R-E, -E, there, there it was happening, their thrones of judgment were set. Now, that throne of the house of David, once again, well, who sits on the throne of the house of David today? No, Jesus Christ does, all right? He's the descendant of David. Okay, we'll say a few moments more about that in a moment. Let me, get, let me make the Old Testament application. David is talking about his own, his own throne. 
All right? But that throne was given to him by God. He's not uplifting himself. He's uplifting God with this. The fact that he sits there is because he was anointed by God. Uh, he had, God had Samuel anoint him with oil. Remember, David wouldn't raise his hand against King Saul when Saul was trying to kill him. David wouldn't raise his hand against King Saul. And what did David say when his men tried to get him to kill king, the king? Remember David's words? Can't, can't do it against uh, God's anointed. Yeah, who am I to raise my hand against God's anointed? I will not do it. God chose him. There's the, there's the glory. God has decided it. God has, has determined it. Well, just like in David's day, anyone who was following God, anyone who was godly wouldn't raise their hand up against David. They recognized his authority, his position, Jesus. By the way, the word Christ is the same as the word Messiah, which is the word that, which is the Hebrew word, for anointed one. Christ is the Greek word for anointed one. And by the way, this is one of those times when, when you, you don't have to be a Greek scholar to know this. Go to John chapter 1, when Andrew went to go get his brother Peter. He says, we have found the Christ. And John writes, which is the Messiah, which means the Messiah. Okay, Greek word, Christ. The Hebrew word, Messiah, Mashiach, okay, and uh, and Christos. But but in doing that, I want to mention that Mashiach because that's what da that's what David said when he had a chance to raise his hand against Saul. I cannot. Who am I to raise my hand against God's Christ, His Mashiach, His Messiah? Not the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Again. Greek words, Hebrew words of the Bible are common everyday words. They're not religious words. And David was merely saying, Saul is God's anointed one. God chose him. I'm not going to raise my hand against him. All right. Well, Jesus is God's anointed one under the old covenant, the anointed one. All right. There's more we could study about that idea of being anointed. That might be a study for some other time. But, but Jesus is the anointed one. God chose him. And so on the day of Pentecost, after Peter told them, you have crucified the one you crucified, God has made Lord and Christ. All right. In, in, in uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 36 and 37, the people cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? We raised our hands against God's anointed one, the anointed one. All right. And so they knew they were in trouble. So this is, this is, again, God's church is God's household. It is, his, it is his holy city, Jerusalem of today. And therefore, it is his kingdom. And Christ is the king, the Mashiach, the Christos, the Christ, the Messiah. Okay, he is that individual. And so... Again, Jerusalem is where the king is, or well, the church is where the king is, God's kingdom. Last point. How am I doing? How am I doing, Julie? <laughs> Ooh, getting close, huh? No, that's wrong time. Oh, well, that's the same. Okay, okay, let's go. <laughs> uh, let's finish up because this is a real simple point in this last one anyway. All right. Uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord, Lord of God, our God, the Lord, our God, I will seek your good. Those last two verses are what I want. He's talking about peace. Peace within God's city, David is saying, within his Jerusalem. That's where it ought to, peace ought to be there. Oh, what you have is a city of God's people. Why should there not be peace there? Any invading army is outside the walls. Peace is in, should most certainly should be inside the city. And for that matter, peace from your enemies is what God was all, what Paul, blah, what David was also praying about. Now, God's church. We've said a few moments ago, Jesus cried, 
Jesus prayed that we would be one as God is one. We would have unity in John chapter 17. 1 Corinthians 13, we already looked at that idea. Or 1 Corinthians 3, we already looked at the idea. God says if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. And he was saying that because in Corinth, they weren't at peace. They were divided. They were fighting. And God, and God was coming down on them through Paul, telling them, you destroy God's, God's building, God's temple, I'll destroy you. Within God's church, there most certainly should be peace. And let me say this. Woe to the individual. Woe to the one who will cause division within God's kingdom. Hear my words, who will cause division. Sometimes division occurs because, because people are teaching false things. Well, that division is going to occur. Who caused it? Who causes division when people are teaching false things? Anyone. Anybody that, that stirs up problems, and that's what uh, the proverb in six, chapter 6, verse 19 said. There are six things the Lord hates, and he ends that with he that soweth discord among the brethren. Yeah, but in my specific example, what I, the response, you know, and I believe that's what you're saying, is the one who's teaching the false things is the one sure. who's doing it. He's the one sowing up discord, teaching false things cannot be accepted in God's kingdom. All right? So never get the idea that we have to stay together no matter what no matter what occurs. All right? We must stay together, stand together on God's word. We must stand together fighting for the truth. Okay? It is God's word that brings us together in the first place. His gospel for us to for us to come together with his word and then to go off in different directions with other things but consider ourselves to be together is not is not what God's talking about we that'd be like saying well I'm part of God's people Jerusalem but I'm not in but I never come to Jerusalem and I'm never part of Jerusalem I'm over here somewhere else okay no 2 minutes 2 minutes or 10 Two. Two. Ooh, okay. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm summing it up anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, uh, so the second thing, for the sake of the house of the Lord, our God. Again, the reason you do it, they're both saying the same thing. For my brothers and companions sake, for the sake of the house of the Lord, our God. In David's day, that's two different things. The people of God and God's holy tabernacle. His structure. Well, you, in the new covenant, they're the same thing. It's not the building we worship in that's holy. It's the people that's holy. We are we are where God resides. It's not, and so the people are the same thing. Do it for their sake. Peace needs to be kept. The one who destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. because And you only got about 30 seconds to make it if you do. <laughs> okay. Let's go to God in the word of prayer and we'll be closed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your kingdom, your house, your church, Father. And help us always to realize that it, that is your people. And help us, Father, to recognize the honor we have of being your people and to use that and to appreciate that honor and to use it for your glory. Recognizing it's not because of us, but that it's because of you. We love you. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. In your son's name, we pray this prayer. Amen.